Good evening, everybody. If I could have everybody's attention. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to all our student athletes, all the members of the Seton Hall community. It's great to have you here. Um, tonight, all of us in Seton Hall Athletics, with, along with our colleagues from the Center of Sports Media, are thrilled to be hosting the ESPNW Campus Conversations. We are honored to have ESPNW here this evening. We are honored to be welcome back so many accomplished members of the panel this evening that are Seton Hall alumni and former student athletes. It's also wonderful to have all of our female student athletes here in the room tonight. All of the faculty and coaches and everyone else for joining us, thank you. Throughout the, uh, the year this past year within the college athletics community, we have been celebrating the 50th anniversary of Title IX. This upcoming year, marks the 50th anniversary of intercollegiate sports here at Seton Hall University, which came to fruition after full co-education arrived on this campus back in 1968. The importance of equality on the playing courts, the fields, and the stadiums at our school and across the nation was beginning to take shape in the early 1970s and has resulted in various milestones and achievements made by local athletes who became not only trailblazers, but memorable personalities in Seton Hall history. Tonight, it's a great opportunity for all of you to learn from the accomplished women who were only in your seats just a few years ago about their experiences as student athletes and how to successfully transition into the real world. Our athletic department hosts a leadership forum each fall, and I would bet most student athletes probably know I say this all the time but that you as a student athlete, you automatically possess the skills that make you incredibly marketable to employers. The ability to compete, to think quickly, to manage your hectic schedules of training and classes and practices and games. But that confidence, that strength, and character that you gain through your sport are the very tools that will help you achieve great success in life and will help you become strong leaders so that you will one day be panelists on this stage. So I thank ESPN again for, ESPNW for bringing us this program and for all of you being here tonight. Uh, we're, please now join uh, me in welcoming from ESPNW, Jane Bullock. And go Pirates, everybody. Hello, it is so awesome to see all of you. We've been planning this event for a while and it's so great that when it finally comes and it happens and you're all here, this is great. I know it's a super cold night and we're just very appreciate, you know, very much appreciate seeing all of you here. Um, so we've got a great program for you tonight. Um, our hope is that you walk out of here feeling supported, confident, energized when you think about life after college. Um, for a little bit of background, ESPNW content offers immersive storytelling and fresh perspectives on the important issues of the moment. We also have a portfolio of events that includes Campus Conversations. Um, since 2016, we have done 43 of these events and we've met with nearly 8,000 student athletes. So we really love meeting with all of you and we learn every time we do it, so very happy to be here. Um, I think the best way to describe ESPNW is through our brand campaign, That's a W. Uh, it celebrates the daily victories, personal triumphs, and endless resilience of women both on and off the field. And I know these are all things that you know a lot about. Um, so let's take a look at the spot. Thank you. Um, we will have some that's a, double, that's a W swag items for you on your way out after the event. Um, and we hope that you'll join the movement yourselves by using hashtag that's a W um, on your social handles to celebrate your own accomplishments and accomplishments of women that you admire. Uh, so what can you expect tonight? Uh, we are here to talk about life after college. All of you have different goals. Some of you may know exactly what you want to do. Some of you may have absolutely no idea what you want to do. A lot of you are in between, probably have a lot of questions and some fear, and we'll get to all of that tonight. Um, we are very lucky to have Christine Williamson here as our moderator. Christine, why don't you head on up? Um, 
Christine hosts many shows on ESPN, including Sports Center on Snap and Countdown to Game Day. Before ESPN, she worked at Stadium as a uh, as a Big 12 correspondent and was at Fox Sports before that. And importantly, she played volleyball at the University of Miami, so she um, can really resonate with uh, and um, remembers being a student athlete. So, Christine, over to you. And she's also the best dressed tonight, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me introduce our wonderful panelists, starting with Daisy Bygrave, who was a track and field athlete and graduated in 1997. She's currently a criminal defense attorney at Bygrave Law, as you heard. That's right. That's her own law. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have Melissa Bellamy, who played volleyball. She graduated. Thoracic, Anesthesiology, and Critical Care Medicine. <laughs> Next, we have Danielle Zanzaleri, softball player, graduated in 2010. She's currently the Assistant Professor of Economics right here at Seton Hall. <laughs> and then finally, we have Flora Kelly, who at ESPN as the VP of Brand Strategy and Content Insights. She graduated from Tulsa University. All right, guys, so excited to be here with you guys. Obviously, we've got to talk a lot uh, before the panel. I want to start with you, Melissa, because you said something that I found very interesting. You majored in biochemistry, but you also said you studied voice, and she did, she did a lot, okay? So as a student athlete, we all know it's very hard to balance being a student athlete and also your major and doing all that kind of stuff. How were you able to balance those things? I think actually looking back on being in college, the busier I was, the easier it was to arrange my schedule. I knew that I had practice in the morning and I had a lift in the afternoon and my classes were at certain times. So there was a very limited amount of time to get my studying done, to write my papers, to run by the research lab. And that taught me structure that I've tried to carry into my life now. Um, just so just trying to carry the same structure that we had in college kind of forced on us into my life. Now I work probably six in the morning until variable times in the day. And I know when I get home, I want to get a workout in. I want to make dinner and I want to maybe watch a TV show before bed or read a paper or talk to that medical student for the next day. Um, and so having a list and just making yourself get stuff done is really helpful. I'm just trying to emulate what you've done in college here. And make sure you work in time for fun too. I feel like that is refreshing and kind of gives you more energy to do the more tough things on your to-do list later. Testing, one, two, three. Okay, there we go. Now you guys can hear me. I, I was projecting earlier. I, could you guys hear me in the back? Okay, good, 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 good. All right, uh, let's go to Daisy because um, obviously Melissa studied a lot in, when she was an undergrad, but for you, how did you decide that you wanted to go into law? So I am from Toronto, Canada, and uh, Coach Moon, who's still around, he gave me a scholarship to come to Seton Hall, but I already knew, for me, I already knew I wanted to be a lawyer. I, I just think, you know, young, from an immigrant family, my parents from Jamaica, doctor, lawyer, right? And I talked a lot, still do, so <laughs> law made sense, but I truly just knew from a very, very young age, and um, I think for me, I, I wanted to honor the gift of the scholarship because I felt like it was a job, and I really wanted to make sure Coach Moon didn't regret giving me a chance and, and allowing me to come here and, and spend so much money on what my parents would have never been able to afford. Um, but I really treated it like a job. I tried to be really responsible and, and work hard on the court, uh, court, basketball people, you know, all the other sports, but <laughs> on the track and, in the, and you know, during our mandatory cross country runs. Um, but I, I found the time to make sure that I could balance and focus on my studies. I did a criminal justice major and a business minor. 
I wanted to kind of beef up my, my degree with a minor. I was interested in, I liked math. I wasn't one of the lawyers that was afraid of math. <laughs> so, um, so I did both. And I think the Canadian educational system, by, back then we had grade 13, which was uh, actually like a college, university type level course. So it wasn't, it really prepared me well oh, for wow. the rigors of university. And so I, I really just tried to put my all into both and did that. Okay, so you guys, since my mic was yelling at everybody, I forgot to allow the panelists themselves to give them their bio so you guys kind of understand how awesome they are. So Daisy, if you could start us off and just tell us how amazing you are and what you currently do. So I am I graduated so long ago that most of you were not born. <laughs> it's really hard to admit that, but I'm proud. I'm pr aging is a gift. So um, and you don't I'm, look at it all. I, I don't mind. I have my grays. It's okay. It looks good in the courtroom, you know. <laughs> so um, I graduated in 1997. When I was here, for those I don't know if some of you still knew Robin Cunningham. She was part of the athletic. Um, academic support, her and Matt Geibel, so Matt was definitely here, is definitely still here, but they both really supported us, and um, so I am from Toronto, Canada. I uh, did become a lawyer. It was in that cafeteria at Seton Hall, if it's still there, because I graduated so long ago, um, that I found out that I got into Harvard Law School. Uh, that was a big deal for me, given you know just my family story, my, my life story. Very amazing day. Um, graduated from Harvard Law School, worked for many years as a public defender. So for those people that cannot afford uh, excellent representation, uh, I, I worked in that field in Washington, D.C., and then in Los Angeles. And then I moved back home, where I've been doing the same criminal defense for over a decade now. Awesome. Melissa. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa. Um, I'm originally from Dallas, Texas and was recruited up here to play volleyball in 2006. Um, had the time of my life in college. My roommate is here with me today and we got to tour campus and we just, we wanna be back in y'all's shoes. There's so much potential here. Um, we're just really excited for y'all. But anyway, I, here I studied biochemistry as my major. I was med school or bust. But after starting, I thought, you know, with volleyball and with studying for med school, I wasn't gonna have time for anything else. And music is such a huge part of my life. I just felt this hole. So I picked up a minor in voice along with the help of Matt Geibel in the academic office um, and a minor in Latin also. And those just made me happy and made me marketable. And then I have a very similar memory. Um, I was tutoring um, in the basement of President's Hall, I think when I got the email that I was accepted to Harvard Medical School. And my parents were on a recruiting trip with my brother at the time, and I called them 14 times until they finally stepped out of the coach's office to <laughs> answer my phone call. Um, but I went up to Harvard Medical School in Boston and loved it, but was ready to get back to my southern roots. So stopped off in Nashville at Vanderbilt where I did my anesthesiology residency, um, did a fellowship in critical care medicine and a fellowship in cardiothoracic anesthesiology, and then finally made my way back home. Um, at each decision point, my dad reminded me how many years I'd been away. Um, and 14 won out. <laughs> so I've moved back home three years ago now to Dallas, Texas, where I now work as an assistant professor of anesthesiology at UT Southwestern. Um, and my passion is education. Um, I feel like I've benefited from some amazingly personable professors here at Seton Hall who are really invested in my learning and my progression after college. Um, so now I'm trying to create that for the residents at UT Southwestern and our medical students. Um, and it's, it's very fulfilling and I'm very excited to be able to be here and talk to y'all. Awesome. So hi, I'm Danielle Zanzaleri. I had some of you in my classes because I teach here now. I love seeing some of your faces. If you have not had me, I teach economics. Come take my class. Um, ask people who've been in it. It's good, but I'm tough. Uh, <laughs> so I grew up in New Jersey. I came to Seton Hall. I played softball. I actually walked onto the team and I later won an athletic scholarship. I had an academic scholarship too. Um, I didn't know, I thought I knew I wanted to be in sports when I started here, sports management, and I quickly realized I was not cold calling people to get like football tickets or, or basketball tickets. Not a problem, that's what you want to do, but that's not my personality. I didn't know what economics was, and um, I took an economics class with Kurt Rothoff, who many of you know either from volunteer swim coach or he teaches in the economics department. 
and that kind of changed my life. And uh, I didn't go to school that was that had economics. I went to a very okay school, um, so I didn't. I wasn't accustomed to kind of having some of those classes that I had here. I loved it. I studied finance. Then I went on to get my doctorate and master's at Clemson University in South Carolina. Um, this is when I was there when they weren't so great at football, but it was a fun time while I was there. I later went on to work at the Federal Reserve in Boston. Melissa and I keep like overlapping out. She left Boston. We miss each other there. by like a year. We graduated <laughs> the same year, so we, we she was volleyball, I was softball, so we're different, but we, we always saw each other. Um, she's smarter. Uh, <laughs> but but um, the, after that, I went to work at Citigroup in Dallas. Well, she was not in Dallas, and then I recently left Dallas to come here and teach. So I opted to come back into the teaching profession outside of. Uh, government and professional banking because I love I love teaching students. I really want everybody to understand economics. I love finance. I do a lot in the personal finance space as well, so I'm always happy to talk about that. Um, I do a lot of consulting in the personal finance space for educators around the country, and so that's kind of my, my passion area. Hi, I'm Flora Kelly. I'm the Vice President of Brand Strategy and Content Insights at ESPN. What that basically means Sports fans in particular, but just understanding how culture influences who we are. I grew up in Queens, New York, which is, I think, the most diverse county in the United States. I'm first generation. My parents are from Peru. And I know I'm a product of them and who they are, but also of watching The Cosby Show when I was a kid and following the 1990s Knicks, who, like, we're the best team ever, but had a grit to them. And like my personality has been shaped by culture, and I've always been interested in that. Um, but for me to get here was a little bit of a winding path. When I graduated college, I went on to get media, and I got a job, I think, at a radio company. And I said, I'm not going, I can go into sales. And then I got into sales, and I realized I'm the worst negotiator there could ever be. <laughs> Um, and then I said, I'd, I'd be in rooms and they'd say, oh, what is the research person thing? And I was like, I could do that. And I went back to college. I think I was in my late 20s. Um, and I got my master's in social research. And I kind of never looked back. And fortunate for me, like, I was able to land a job at ESPN, which is the best sort of company to work at. I think the piece of advice I would give you guys is work for a company where people really love Perfect. All right, guys. Uh, Danielle, I want to ask you this because obviously you're a student athlete, but you also currently teach student athletes and non student athletes. I don't know what you guys call them. We used to call them NARPs. Okay. <laughs> you guys are still great. <laughs> if you're a non student athlete, it's still great. Um, what characteristics do you notice in student athletes that maybe aren't in regular students? I can at least say for the female student athletes in here, they tend to be among the better students in class because they come to class, one, because you kind of have to, um, <laughs> two, they're attentive, they ask questions, and that, I think building relationships with your faculty members now is really important. I teach over 100 students, I've taught over 1,000 students in my lifetime. People that build a relationship with me have a relationship with me for life. I help out with their resume. I've helped out with some people's resumes in this room. I've tried to get people scholarships that are in this room. I am willing, and most of your faculty are like this, not just in the business school. They're willing to go out on a limb for you. And this is important even if you feel like you don't have a connection with your faculty. Anybody, a mentor on, camp, on campus, an administrator, people care about other people. and. But that starts with you, you know, you caring about them as well. And so being interested in what they're doing, if it's a class you like, really get to know that faculty member. They might have a connection for you. They might know somebody at a grad school you want to go to. And they are going to make a personal call if they have some sort of relationship with you. So I would say that what makes you guys special and your unique advantage is is that you are great students, because I have you in my classes, you are great students, and use that to your advantage for that next step that you want to do. Uh, Flora, I'm going to ask you this because um, 
you were a late ad, but we love that you're here. Uh, it's so great that Flora's here. We love, we love this for her. <laughs> um, what qualities do you look for in people when you hire them, and what qualities do you think that you see in student athletes that stand out? Yeah. I think um, there's three qualities that I look for and that I tend to see in student athletes. And one is, um, mental toughness and by that I mean the world and, and corporate America is going to throw a lot at you and you have to be able to manage your mind the way you manage your mind during a game and if you're down by 10 and if the self-talk is negative you're going to just go down that hill you more than anything it's that and that sort of ability to do that will create success in your career Two, I think a lot of women, or most women, we've been trained <laughs> to not be as confident, to not speak up, to not sort of own who we are. I think women's sports and sort of the ability for you to be in the team, to have an equal voice, like the maturity I get from young women who have played sports versus women who haven't, and that confidence is there, and that's something, you know, that is like so critical, especially in the early years of your career. And then finally, like resilience. Um, there are going to be moments in your career where you get knocked down. Um, you don't get the promotion. You don't get the project that you want. Um, the ability to sort of take what's going on and say, okay, how can I do the best here? How do I make this a positive? How do I work through that? Again, something you learn as you're in your, you know, your sports, it's something that you learn to sort of build that resilience. You're not going to get that knocked down. You're going to come back up. And those are sort of really core critical areas that I look for and that I know sort of help build people's careers. If I can maybe yeah. take it back off for of sure. that, Flora. Um, I'm now a mom. I, my daughter's 12. My son is 7. But when I talk to my daughter and, and young you know, her friends. Um, sports gives you, because I'm really trying to convince her to choose something and <laughs> pursue something. I think, you know, I feel like I'm at a point in my career where I'm quote unquote successful. I have employees, I pay salaries, they support me, they do what I tell them to do. It's really crazy, it's really fun. Um, but um, I think when I'm in the courtroom and, and it's difficult and, and I'm preparing for trial and every bar exam that I've taken, I've taken far too many. Oh my gosh, I'm moving around too much. But um, whenever I'm getting ready for a bar exam and literally like it's game day, it's the day of the exam and it's the lunch break, I find myself hearkening back to my student athlete training more than anything Harvard ever taught me, right? And it's, it's literally like stretching, it's breathing, it's like the positive self-talk, it's like, you know, I can do this and it, it truly makes a difference and, and even in hiring, I don't see enough student ex-student athletes when I'm trying to hire people, but if I did, I would gravitate towards them because it, it doesn't mean that you were the star of the team. Like, you heard me say, like, I really wanted to hope that Coach Moon didn't regret giving me a chance. I was not the star, I was not his, you know, trophy girl. I, I wasn't the best athlete on the team, but I tried my best to be a contributing member, to, to be that fourth leg on the relay that could get that All-American status, right? Like, they needed me for that, but I was not by far the fastest or even the second fastest. Maybe not even the third fastest, I know. You know, but it takes four. So, you know, I really just think no matter where you find yourself in your sport, um, whether you're the, on the bench or not, you are learning tools that are going to help you in the future and like even as old as I am now, I'm still calling upon them and, and I, I really think that's something that might encourage you. Daisy, I want to ask you about this because you mentioned those tools and I don't know how many crime junkie or girlies are out there that love true crime. I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts, I'm obsessed. Uh, but you have defended homicide cases. Yeah. So what in your athletic days helped prepare you for to be in such an, inten an intense game day like that? Oh gosh, I, I remember my competitors. I remember Georgetown, I remember Villanova, I remember being on the line, I remember Penn Relays, I remember Big East, I remember Nationals, I remember the ends, but like every day at practice, like practice was intense, right? Like 
my, call, my, my fellow teammates were really, really good and we had to show up every day to try to make sure that I was still earning the right to have this scholarship, at least in my heart, at least in my mind. And so I just, it was the whole package. And it is the balancing, you know, they say if you want something done, give it to a busy person. It is the fact that, you know, we had to be selective about what course we took because we were on the road every Friday and sometimes Thursday. Mm -hmm. So, you know, thinking ahead, talking to the professor, look, this one is only offered Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm going to miss almost every Friday. But is that going to be okay? It's just the whole package of what it takes to, to try hard, mm -hmm. regardless of how well you're doing, yeah. to try hard and put yourself out there and to be able to lose, right? To be able to get your feelings hurt because the coach isn't talking to you this week because you didn't run so well, you know? All of the above helps me day to day, you know, be tough. I have way more grit than my competitors right, in the right. courtroom. Just way more, way more grit. <laughs> uh, I like that you use the word grit because me and Melissa were talking about that word um, a little bit before. But Melissa, I also, um, uh, Daisy just mentioned something about how she gravitates towards people that are former student athletes. And you told me a story about your brother um, when he was going to get his first job. So I want you to relay that story to, to everybody here because I think it was an amazing story. I, I really want to tell you guys this story to encourage yourselves and to also give you a talking point for interviews. So my little brother played football at Michigan and as you guys who are very athletic and very devoted to your sport know, summer internships are not something that are an option for a lot of people who use that summer period to train and to get ready for the next season. Um, so after college, he was getting his MBA and they had mandatory internships. So he was going through a series of interviews. And in each of the interviews, they always asked, how much experience do you have? What previous internships have you done? And Oftentimes, at the end of the interview, they were like, no, we need someone who just has more experience in the business world. Until he got to American Airlines, where he is now, and his interviewer was a former softball player. And he started off, he'd been really turned off by this, and said, you know, just to start things off, I have not done a prior internship. If that is a game, game breaker, um, let's just end this interview, you know? Um, and she said, what are you talking about? Football, you were a quarterback. That was your internship the mental toughness, all of the skills that we've all been talking about up here, how to perform under pressure, all of those things teach you so much more than an internship crunching numbers at an accounting firm is going to teach you. Um, take what you've learned in sports, take that grit, take that mental toughness, that time management, that teamwork that you're learning, um, and pitch yourself. Say, if somebody asks you about internships in an interview, say, okay, my internship was playing Sport X at Seton Hall. I devoted my life to them for four years, and this is what I learned from it. And that's why I'm going to be an excellent employee. Yeah. So in every job that I've had, I talked about being an athlete. And more than often than not, we did not, we did not talk about the job. I got hired at Citigroup because I was on a team sport. They knew I already could work on a team. They didn't have to ask, like, are you going to be able to work with this person from New York and this person from Dubai? It's like, yeah, I could work with whoever. I could talk to management. I can talk to the current CEO. I've been in meetings with the current CEO of Citigroup, who wasn't the CEO at the time, which is a, was a lot higher level than I was at. But they felt comfortable because I know how to talk to people because I was on a team. Mm -hmm. So that always got brought up. Or even just talking about your love of sports. People like other things. Melissa likes voice obviously she likes sports too but finding that common ground sports tend to be that for someone bring that up in an interview I at, at the Boston Fed I went to Clemson the person that was hiring me was a big South Carolina fan South Carolina and Clemson don't like each other so that was a really big talking point and that got me to talk about my team and my experience employers love it I also hired at the Fed so we were hiring for like research assistants uh, two kind of quick tips Yes, put very clearly that you're an athlete. Don't bury it on the very bottom. Put it up top. Say you're a Division One athlete. And put Division One because mm -hmm. two and three still do a lot of work, but we know what it takes to be a Division One athlete and all the hours and all the traveling, the, the much farther traveling that you do as a Division One athlete than maybe Division Two or three. Put that really clear. If you won any awards, whether it's like a team award, whether you won um, a Big East student scholar. That's a fantastic award. Again, it's showing you multiple times. I am an athlete. I am an athlete. And the second thing is have white space on your resume because we read lots of them. More words 
are not better. White space, white space. So make things clear. Make every single point matter. If you have too many words and I'm reading 300, I'm just skipping. I need to be able to look quickly in like 10 seconds and see, athlete, this internship, you like this field. Okay, yes pile. If it's like, where is all this information, you're going to the no pile. Especially for a job that's really competitive. Um, so like if you want to work at a really big bank, if you want to work at something like that, I can tell you that's how we do it. So white space matters. Uh, I want to ask you, Danielle, because you were a walk-on to start. And I remember when I was a student athlete, and I used to think that the walk-ons were crazy because, Melissa, as you said, it's hard. Practice is hard. And I'd be like, why are you here voluntarily? Um, but you eventually ended up getting a scholarship. And then throughout your career, you've made a lot of pivots. So explain kind of how you've made those pivots. Right. So I was recruited like the D2, D3 level, and I... I graduated valedictorian in my high school, so academics was always important to me. I got an academic scholarship here, and it was really funny because I got in a few schools in the country, and it was raining the day Seton Hall had an open house, and I lived like 30 minutes away. I grew up 30 minutes away. My mom said, Danielle, you're not gonna go to this school. Like, I'm tired of going on all these college visits. It's raining, it was like pouring, right? I'm not going. And my dad's like, no, I've watched Seton Hall basketball on TV. Like, we should just go. Like, let's just see what the campus is. And they were given like a free lunch, and he was excited about it. So I'm like, okay, I went, and I fell in love. And I still tell my mom that story because she like didn't want to go, and I fell in love and all that. And so I took a chance. I said, I want to be. I'm an academic first, an athlete second. I'm a student first, athlete second. And I really believe that. Obviously, I'm in education. I really believe that. But I love sports. Um, I love being around sports. So for me, it was, I'm gonna try this and I know I can do this. Um, so then I made the team, and the teammates back there visiting, hey, there's a softball reunion on Sunday, so hey. <laughs> um, so, um, so that was the first step. And then, but each year it was kind of a tryout because new people were coming in that could take my spot and take my, my um, position. And then eventually, um, what I didn't get from an academic scholarship, I got from an athletic scholarship. So it was rewarding the, the work. But I remember having an internship going into my sophomore year, freshman and sophomore year, at a pharmaceutical company. And I knew some really good freshmen were coming in and my spot was gonna be contested. And I would get up every morning, go to the gym in the summer, had my internship, from like whatever nine to five, and as soon as I come home, I had a pitching net. I was a pitcher with the four corners. And I was pitching. I put holes in my parents' fence. Um, I, had, I basically made a pitching lane. We only had so our yard was about 50 feet. 43 of it was the pitching lane. Um, multiple holes are still in my parents' fence that they never fix. <laughs> and I ended up dropping like 10 pounds. Came back really muscular, just because I really cared. I gave it my all and that showed up and that escalated me even like on the depth chart, uh, didn't put me up here, but hey, it brought me up a little bit and then it led to like a senior year scholarship. So I think the hard work and if you know you want something, go for it. I would have been so disappointed if I never even tried. When Look, I was a division one player. The same as anybody else here was recruited division one player. Um, I wasn't recruited, but I, I was the same spot as you, as the same teammate. Um, and then when, in terms of careers, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I switched majors twice while I was at Seton Hall. Sports management, then marketing, um, and then I went to finance. After school, I went to the Fed. After I was at the Fed for about a year and a half, I said, uh, I'm not really a government employee. Um, things run a little bit slow in the government. Just a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm an economist, I like efficiency, so I moved to Dallas and I went to a private bank. I was in banking. I'm like, okay, I like banking. I, I made pretty good money, and I said, but man, I'm bored. I'm bored and I'm a student athlete. I, I don't want to sit at the wall all day kind of bored. I right. want to do things that inspire me. You want to be around people that are excited. Mm -hmm. So then I went back into academia and I said, what's more challenging and exciting than a bunch of like 18 to 21 year olds that don't know anything? <laughs> and and I, I've pivoted for that. And then what I was lacking maybe in teaching, I can do in consulting. And I'm always finding different opportunities that meet my skill set and my desires in that particular moment. And what I was told out of school was if, and you probably heard this too, if you get a PhD, you have to go to academia because ac the academics only like academics, they don't want people in industry. Now I'm going to tell you this, my students like true. that I'm in industry and it actually helps me on the job interviews. Mm -hmm. So people are going to tell you, no, you can't do it all the time and you say, yes, I'm going to do it and here's how I'm going to do it and I'm going to go out there. And even, uh, and 
I'm very happy to see, you know, I'm gonna be here, but I'll take interviews. If people wanna interview me for a job, why not? Go on the experience, get, get to understand what they want. And you can say, oh, I don't really like that. I don't really like that position. Now, I have a kid here, I'm from New Jersey, I'm staying here, so I'm not leaving, so you guys will take me. <laughs> but I am pregnant, so I won't be here in the fall, but if you wanna take my class, come take it in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to piggyback off of what she said. For those of you interested in medicine, this is a decision way down the road, but if you're interested in teaching or think you may want to be in academia at some point, you absolutely do not have to go straight from residency into an academic position. I work with people that worked a couple of years in private practice, and the experience and the different knowledge that they bring to academia is appreciated. So we actively look for people that have different experiences other than just following the pipeline set for you. I love that. Uh, Flora, I want to ask you this because um, Danielle mentioned something about how sports really bring people together. Obviously, you work at ESPN. It's the mecca. How have you seen sports in general with your coworkers and people that you work with on a daily basis, people that you've interviewed, bring people together? The deep question. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think if you think about what happened during the pandemic, We were able to deliver the draft and the last dance. I think that's going to go down in history as a moment where sports brought everyone together. And so being a part of that, being a part of an organization that builds community is so important. Um, I think for me, it's making sure that we're as expansive when we talk about community and the organization that we can be. And so like the biggest notion is like if you had a moment where you love sports, you're a sports fan. Because I think for a lot of women, and you may have felt this yourself, there's a little bit of a velvet rope when you say you're a sports fan. There's an instant prove it. Right? And it's like almost like you gotta go through your criteria of fandom. Well, I'm a sports fan here. And so as a brand, are we making sure we are feeling as inclusive? We are not creating that experience. And as I look at the younger generation, your generation, and the way you define your identity, and it's very intersectional, and it isn't sort of hardcore, traditional, avid, and whatever traditional notions we have of sports fandom, I really want to make sure that the community that we're building at ESPN is inclusive of that. Now, from a professional perspective, in terms of community, I would say the biggest advantage I see in young athletes who come into um, our organization is one of the biggest challenges young people have, and even executives have, is as you transition, as you get higher and higher in your career, it's less about me and it's more about me. And that's a hard pivot for a lot of young people I see in the organization. Because they might have been a rock star, the best producer. They may have been a rock star, the best analyst, the best sort of creative. But then they get into these leadership positions and they don't know how to coach. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to manage the team in totality. They don't know how, even younger people, they don't know how to like give their coworker a pat on the back. That builds organization, it's culture, it's community. And so as you sort of go into the workforce and you start interviewing, even like signaling, like I understand it's not just about me, it's about the team that I'm joining, right? Because you've been a part of the team. Like for me, that would signify like instant maturity. I want her, she's got a level of maturity that I typically don't see with um, some more junior folks. Uh, Melissa, I know that we talked about this also, uh, what Flora just touched on about the fact that as a student athlete, you are used to being a team player. Uh, what examples have you seen that in your career? Oh, absolutely. So I work in the operating room a lot. There's a lot of different personalities in the operating room. Surgeons have a particular personality, anesthesiologists have a different personality, the nurses, the perfusionists, et cetera. But we all have a common goal. We want the best outcome for the patient. And so we all have to work together and <laughs> but we hope, we hope. Yeah. Yes, oh absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> No, most people are very good. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> um, but we have to work together and we have to use our own individual talents um, and be comfortable changing 
positions in the team in the OR when the situation changes. So for example, the surgeon usually runs the show and everyone else helps support, but if something goes wrong with the patient, it is my job to step up and be like, I need you to stop and we're gonna fix this. Um, I need to take charge for a second and get the patient into a better position and then the surgeon can take over again. And I think that that is something that we all experience in sports. Not everybody is the captain of the team. We all have our own position and we have to work together to achieve the team goals. Um, I know I started out as a middle blocker. Um, the coach that recruited me was not the coach that I played for. Um, the first thing that I was told when I met this coach was, wow, you're too short to play middle blocker. And I was like, but I can jump. And he said, I don't care. <laughs> um, and that taught me to really work hard to prove myself. But also, I was able to transition a couple years later when we recruited girls that were 6'3", 6'4", um, which I'm so grateful I'm not now. Um, <laughs> to play my position and I changed to right side and together we were all able to make it to the Big East Championship which is something my team hadn't done yet so that was wonderful and um, so I think as an athlete we're put in those positions much more than people who haven't been in athletics and we're able to transition and pivot um, and one other thing I wanted to bring up you were talking about mental toughness earlier um, I feel like that's something we're all used to working in really high pressure situations. Um, I'm going to relate this to volleyball again, but I'm a middle blocker, I didn't play back row. Um, being on back row, serving on game point, terrifying. But you go back and you say, okay, this is like what I've done at practice a million times. And you don't let the heat of the moment scare you. So my patient's coding in the operating room, I don't have time to freak out. I have to shift right into action mode, just like we would in a stressful game. And so having that mental toughness, the strength, the calm, um, to deal with high stress situations is something that I think is especially unique to our group of people. Um, I like that example of serving. Uh, I was going to say before you said a patient coding that then when you do make the mistake, you realize it's not the end of the world, but that is definitely oh. the end of the world. <laughs> They're so also they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> just kidding. It's the end of the world. Okay, Daisy, I want to ask you this because um, like we mentioned, there's a lot of skills that you can learn as a student athlete that translate into your career. What do you think um, was the biggest lesson that you learned as a student athlete that also translates? I mean, I think it relates to some of the things I've already been speaking on. I think you, you need to be humble enough, and I don't think I lacked for humility because I come from some very simple folk, okay? But humble enough to ask for help. Mm -hmm. um, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer, and I really want to just say a quick caveat. It is from a place of ignorance why my Jamaican immigrant parents who were living in Toronto believed that doctor, lawyer, I feel like this is like a poor example on some levels, you know, means you've made it or, you know, is there are so many careers out there. There are mm -hmm. so many things to do and I'm really encouraging my children not to set their mind on one particular thing too early. If it, if it resonates with you, fine, but like do well, be a strong student, be a strong athlete and allow life to unfold for you. But I didn't have, I didn't know any lawyers. I did not have not one lawyer person I could call for advice. I really truly relied on Robin um, Cunningham and Matt Geibel. The academic support for the athletes was, I, I didn't know what it meant to take the LSAT. I would I'm say, you know, this is who I am, this is my goal, reach out for help. Um, as busy as we were as track athletes, I know Robin, you were instrumental in me securing an internship. Like, I worked for a judge. Like I, I saw a verdict come in in a criminal court downtown Newark as a student, you know, here at Seton Hall. Um, I remember the mom passing out. Like you know, you know, we had to call up the ambulance. It was not a good verdict, uh, and it was a really sad case. And I got to speak with that judge so often in the few days that I could go. So, you know, humble yourself. Be open for help. Know that you're not in it alone. And then the rest of what you're just learning, just being who you are, will be a tool. It just absolutely will. No matter where you find yourself on the pecking order of your teams, you'll be able to keep calling on that forever. Like it, athletics translates so seamlessly into the real world. It's just insane. So I'm like, please, children, please be athletic. I mean, I wasn't an athlete until the last time. 
definitely like athletically built, but I have uh, managed a lot of I've managed a lot of student athletes that have come in through the organization. I'll tell you a story. I had someone who was a pitcher at Boston College, and I was a young manager at the time. And you know, I had to do his review, and I was like very uncomfortable because it was like my first time managing, and he came in with such confidence. He's like, "Tell me what I can do better." And it was this like, "I want to be coached." Right? Like, you don't get that a lot with like people who didn't play sports when they were younger. And that sort of openness to, yeah, this isn't a this isn't personal. This isn't about like I'm bad. It's like, no, I want to get better. I want to be coached, coach me. And he actually, even though I was his manager, taught me that. And I think again, as you're sort of building out your career, having that attitude is another competitive advantage that you're bringing to that. I want to add to that too. Daisy mentioned Robin and Matt being really pivotal for her at, at Seton Hall here. Um, and Matt's still here, and Amanda's great. We went to school with Amanda. Mm -hmm. um, and, and your other ones are great too. Your faculty is also really there for you. You can absolutely reach out to them in whatever field. And I'm not just saying that as a faculty member, I really like talking to students, and I know your faculty members too. If you're interested in anthropology, go talk to the anthropology professor. If you want to work in athletics, you have all these administrators standing here, and they're really nice. If you haven't talked to them that much, ask them about what they do every day. Would you actually want to do that? I mean, a lot of people that play sports want to work in sports. There's ESPN uh, W professionals here. Pull them to the side. Ask them if you can meet them in the city for coffee. One of the things that I did when, in all parts of my career, I reached out to people on LinkedIn, people I didn't know that had a job that I was considering. When I was in Dallas, I was like thinking about shifting from banking, as I mentioned. And I thought, maybe I'll go into some like marketing finance thing. I'm not a marketer, I'll tell you that. But I thought I was for a moment. So I reached out to grab coffee, and I met up with coffee with this person. I had no idea who. They ended up working at Pier 1 Imports. Good thing I didn't want to go there, because they went defunct like six months later. <laughs> but I met up with this person, and in this conversation with this first 15 minutes, I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. This would be awful. But guess what? I now know that whole like industry is something I'm not interested in. I didn't have to switch jobs for it. I just reached out and made a connection, offered to buy someone coffee. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to cost a lot. You don't even have to buy them coffee, but usually works. Hey, I'll buy you coffee. Be open to going on their schedule. If you want to talk to, like you're in Dallas, you want to talk to Melissa. She's an anesthesiologist. I will meet you whenever. I want to talk to you about anesthesiology. I'm interested in it. People really do want to help other people on this campus and off. Um, the people here today are obviously here for a reason. They care. The people on the sides are here because they care. And the faculty are here because they care. And so without just like, you know, the academic support services who really do care, because I know what they do because they had to deal with us. They, the days rate, they deal with you guys. It, it's a lot. Um, but people do care, so ask them. Ask them what they do. Ask them how how they can help you learn about the LSATs. Ask them what a GRE is. Ask them how to get that scholarship. Ask them. They're going to help you. Mm -hmm. And just piggybacking off of that, with each step you take in your career, the world shrinks. Um, so really do reach out to those people that do what you think you want to do um, because they will know someone. Say you want to be in a different part of the country. Chances are they've crossed paths with somebody where you want to be and that's how you get jobs through people knowing people and reaching out and going out on a limb for you. All right, perfect. I believe now it is time for some questions from the audience. Uh, there are microphones on either side of the room. If anybody has a question for our panelists, go on and approach the mics. Hello? Okay, awesome. Hi, I'm Mackenzie Yoakum. I'm a freshman volleyball player. My major is journalism. I would love to be a sports broadcaster. That's like my biggest um, goal right now. It's actually really funny that you guys mentioned grit. We, as a team today, had a team meeting and we were talking about grit. It was the one thing that we're setting on this spring season. Um, I just had, wanted to ask, um, so you guys, for who played or at athletics, you guys always grew up knowing that you wanted to play your respected sport. Um, I know personally, like I grew up knowing that I wanted to play college volleyball and I was so gritty that I just pursued that. But then like, I was just wondering, how did you find the love for your occupation 
may, um, after just being so fixated on sports. Like, the recruiting process is very similar to the interview process. Um, I just wanted to ask you about that. Like, Daisy, you said setting your life too early on something that you want to do. Like, when was that turning from sports to this is what I want to do in the future? So thank you for your question, Mackenzie. Um, for me, I actually, I, I just want to make sure I'm not just promoting the kind of person I am. I, I knew what I wanted to do from as young as I can remember. And so for me, much like Danielle, I mean, I was, an, I was a student first. I was an academic first. And sports was another vehicle to achieving my dreams. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to honor it, but I, I was so happy to finally become a lawyer. The passion translated quite nicely. I did a lot of sports growing up. I mean, as in the free ones, because my parents didn't have much money. So I, I played basketball and volleyball. Loved volleyball. You know, basketball, volleyball, track, cross country. I did all of those sports. I was pretty athletic, but track just seemed to be the one that might be able to get me a, a, a free ride, right? Like a, 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 a way to go to such an expensive institution without having to spend a dollar. My sister, two years older than me, she needed $500 to go to a, a Canadian university, and my dad was like, good luck. Like, there's no savings for our schooling. There were six of us. I don't fault them. So for me, that, that's, um, that was an easy one. It, it translated very nicely. I, I loved sports, but it was a vehicle to, to my academic ends. I'd like to add in on that. Um, sorry, Will. No, go for it. Um, I thought I wanted to be a sports management major because I love sports. I'm like, who wouldn't want to be an agent or something like that? Probably many of you felt that way. And then I realized some of the careers started out in sports uh, sales, like ticket sales. And I said, oh, I don't want to grit. I don't really want to grit through that. That's really not my personality to be like, please buy me season tickets. Like, yay. Like, that's just not really my personality. And I took classes here to figure out what I liked. And I liked econ and finance. And I thought, ooh, finance. I had two internships. I tried to make it work during the off season in the fall with like one day a week. I, I talked to an employer to giving me a job for just an eight hours once a week and I'll do some work at home. This is before more work at home. And I got to try out being a certified financial planner. And a lot of it was cold calling, that same kind of skill set as ticket sales. And I said, okay, guess what I don't want to be? I don't want to be this. But I had an internship for about four months to figure that out. Then I went to be a financial analyst because again, I want to be finance and that's these starting positions. And I found out very quickly that in this particular role was through a pharmaceutical company I, that they make, they make the drug Claritin that everybody knows. That was the first allergy drug before it went generic, so Claritin used to be the only thing. And I worked there and I was bored out of my mind. And I'm not someone that likes to be bored. I'm like, why? I'm an efficient person. I don't want to sit here and wait for the day when I have no work. I want to do things that are inspiring. Finance wasn't it. I went into a professor's office and said, help me. I was I think I was crying on the couch, to be honest with you. It was Kurt Rothoff's office. He goes, go get your PhD. I'm like, a PhD, what? My parents haven't went to college. What do you mean PhD? Like, that wasn't even in the realm. He said, pursue it. Start thinking about it. So I started thinking about it, and I started to like what I saw. So really, my advice to you is, you want to be a sports journalist, take the classes. They start to, if the classes you don't like, then that's telling. But if they, you like the classes, take an internship. See what you like, and if not, maybe that sports journalism, it's great if you love it and you want to be it, but say you take it, it's underwhelming, and you decide that you'd rather be a different kind of journalist, journalist on war or something, or not even a journalist, something else with sports, pursue it. Your path doesn't have to be linear. Mm -hmm. And speaking like certified financial planning, I love personal finance. I just didn't like that job. So I do a lot of personal finance consulting. Like you could do a lot of journalism in a different way. Maybe it's through social media and not through like an ESPNW. I'm not saying that is, but your life doesn't have to be linear and you can pivot along the way. The thing is you need to try internships. You need to try different classes. That's the only way you're gonna know. Again, I didn't go through your but um, and, you know, I think what you're saying is you found something in your life that you really love and that's a big part of your identity. And I think what I'm hearing is you say you're a little sad about it and you want to know how do I go from this world that I love and find that in another era of your life. I think we've all experienced that. I mean, I'm a mom, my daughter is going to go to college. Like, when you go through those moments, it's okay to be a little sad, but it's also be self like spend time, like who do I want to be in the next five years? What do I want to keep from that identity into who I become? Again, you've been so blessed that you found something that you love so dearly. 
um, and it's okay to be sad, but like just, you will find that passion in your career. Just give yourself the time and the space and really figure out like, what is it that I love and can I take pieces of that? Like, so for me, I do like public speaking. You're like, well, you're in insights. How does that work? I can do that a lot in my job. I like writing. I can do that a lot in my job. So maybe I'm not an author, but I've taken an element that I'm good at and brings me that energy in my day to day, right? Like sports brings you that energy. Find that. Even if the first five years of your career, you're like, this isn't it, this isn't it. Take it from me, your career is gonna be long. You're gonna, you don't wanna get stuck 30 years doing something that you didn't find that energy is I just have a quick comment. It's okay to have two passions. Yeah. It's yeah. totally fine. Yeah. There's room for both. Also, I want to say that when I was in undergrad, I also knew that I wanted to go into sports journalism, and my professor looked at all the people that raised their hands and said they wanted to go into broadcast journalism for sports specifically, and he said, good luck, it's very competitive, and I was like, hi, I play volleyball, I'm a very competitive person, thank you. That's a challenge. Um, any other questions? <laughs> No, no money? Okay. I think we have time for probably one more. Hello, uh, my name is Sarah. I'm on the swim team here, and I'm a diplomacy and economics major. And my question for the panel is, what's the best piece of interview advice you have to specifically highlight that you're an athlete and that uh, and like the soft skills that it gives you instead of just like the hard skills that are very clear on your resume. I could, um, I'm doing some interviewing in the last few years. One question that I find particularly difficult, I am a fairly confident person, that's fair, but is what are your weaknesses? You know, or tell me something you can work on. I think that's a really great place to try to, you know, segue that into, well, it kind of reminds me when I was an athlete at, you know, this particular school, you name drop, right, and you talk about your sport. So I feel like that might be a, a, nice, a nice place to turn a, a question that is just awkward in an interview to talk about a weakness into something that is such a strength, right? Like I was the walk-on and, you know, I found that at times I would get down, but what I realized is if I set my goals and I set my intentions, I could accomplish it and this is what I did. So that's my one piece and I'll let anyone else share. A question I like to ask people, um, you probably had this all in your mock interviews, is tell me about a time that you struggled and how you overcame it and I feel like that lends itself so well to an athletic story. Um, I, I second all of them. I was thinking the weakness question, it always comes up like, name a time you struggled or you had a conflict with a team member, and it's like, well, <laughs> I had 20 team members, played for four years, you're bound to run into some frustrations, and how do you kind of overcome them? It's just a, such a great question. Even if they ask you what's your strengths, that's where you segue. I, I can communicate really well on the team. I can deal under pressure. I know how to balance a travel schedule, five classes, an internship or a lab. I'm applying to grad school. I mean, I as an athlete, I know how much you do. And if any of them have ever been an athlete or have a cousin, anyway, that'll immediately say, wow, they know how to prioritize things in their life. So you do want to drive the conversation back to being an athlete. So I would take the strength or the weakness question, as they mm -hmm. said, because that's the easiest avenue for that. All right. I think that's all the time that we have for our panel. Give it up for our lovely panelists. <laughs> okay, so it's now time for our breakout sessions. We're going to have Jane McManus, the Executive Director of the Center for Sports Media, explain how we're going to do those. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. What an in impressive group of people up there. And someday we're going to have ESPNW back, and then one of you or a couple of you are going to be up here on the stage, and that's going to be pretty exciting too. Um, I want to thank Tom and Tatum for putting this together and working so hard. In, in 2010, I started out as one of the original columnists for ESPNW and worked at ESPN for 10 years. So it's incredibly, I don't know, rewarding for me to see you know, my former family with my current family. So thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, 
also, I just want to acknowledge everybody out there who wants to be in sports media and say, you know, I run the Center for Sports Media. And if you're interested in that, come and talk to me. Um, because I will help connect you with different experiences like this. Uh, events, panelists, classes, things like that that can help you hone that skill and that talent. And we have, in particular, the next one, February 16th, when we have Billie Jean King and Alana Kloss coming here to campus to talk at the University Center at 1 o'clock. And I'd love to see a lot of you all in the audience there as well. So for the breakout sessions, <laughs> you're all invited, <laughs> by the way. Um, we have. Um, now that we've heard from the panelists and moderator, you're going to have an opportunity to continue the conversation in small groups. We're going to break you up by class, and you will be paired with two leaders. We have some additional women here to help lead the breakout sessions, along with the panelists. Uh, breakout leaders, please stand up and wave. There you are. All right. Um, this is a great opportunity to learn more from these women and ask questions, talk through any issues on your mind, and most importantly, have fun and enjoy yourself. Uh, before I let you know where you're going, please remember that you must come back to the panel area after breakout sessions. Do not leave. We're going to have a brief closing, and you're going to receive a gift from ESPNW, and then we will send you on your way. Uh, so the locations, and this is where this is where you have to pay attention again. Um, freshmen will be in Fahey Room 101 with Robin Cunningham and Cassandra Harrigan. Sophomores will be in Fahey Room 2 with Daisy Bygrave and Kai Renane, waving, waving her hand around. Uh, juniors will be in Fahey Room 7 with Christine Williamson, Melissa Bellamy. And seniors will stay here in Bethany Hall with uh, Danielle Zanzalari and Flora Kelly. So there you go. All right, and good luck. Find your way. Come on back All after right. it's done. Good luck. What a great night, right? What a powerful night. Really meaningful. Thank you to everybody. Um, especially, let's thank our ESPN people, Jane, Stennett, and your colleagues for putting this together for us tonight. Thank you so much. Christine Williamson, superstar moderator, thank you so much. Hey, if anything is about anything in life, it's about gratitude. And I think tonight was just one of the most powerful nights that I've spent in a long time. So please continue to give it up. Also, Jane McManus, where are you? Our liaison to ESPNW and our executive director of Seton Hall Center for Sports. How many of you know who Billie Jean King is? Please, come on. Find out who Billie Jean King is. And she's going to be on this campus. If you guys do not show up for that, you're crazy. No question. Okay, our athletic department, thank you so much. Brian Felt, Tatum Kolitz, R Roberto Sasso, who did the food. We love food, thank you. <laughs> Tom Chen, think about it. You made a choice to come to Seton Hall, whatever reason you made it for. But please know you're affiliated with an athletic department that thinks it's important that there are nights like this for you. That's a really special thing. More important than anything, our distinguished alums who came back tonight to spend this time with you and share their own experiences with you. All of these outstanding women one day sat in your seat. And now they sat up there. Other people have mentioned that. They took advantage of everything that Seton Hall had to offer them. And look where they got. They, they worked hard. They played hard. They cared about other people. They showed passion, persistence, and pride in everything they've done. And they cared about you enough to come back. They all went to work today. They're all going tomorrow. Some of them traveled from far away. But they cared enough to come back. That's what Seton Hall's about, about caring about the next person. So I can't thank the alums especially for coming back and sharing everything that you shared tonight. Um, these people are your role models. So I hope you've talked to them, shared contact information, get to know them, get their numbers, stay in touch with them. Thank you to everybody, and go Pirates! Excuse me? Drive. Thank you, Robin. Um, Robin made virtually every thank you that I was just about to make. So to the panelists, Christine, 
breakout session leaders, uh, the Seton Hall team working with them has just been fantastic. Brian, Tom, Tatum, Roberto, Jane McManus, just really, really terrific partners throughout. Um, I have one more ask of all of you, which is um, please take out your phones and we've got a very short survey that we really would love for all of you to take right at this moment. Um, we read every word of feedback that we get on this program and, um, and your, uh, your opinions matter a lot. So I'm just gonna stand here in awkward silence for two minutes while you all do this for us. And then we'll us and Christine, our moderator, once again. And um, we've got, uh, on your way out, we've got some ESPNW swag. So please enjoy that. And um, thanks again. This has been a great night with all of you. Really appreciate it. Okay, good night.